Incredible! A rat ate it! And a pack of plum liquor. This area, 220 kilometers north of Tokyo, is being overrun by rats and other wild animals. Wild boars are crossing the streets in broad daylight. That monkey is asleep. The monkey looks relaxed. All of this would have been unthinkable before March 2011. The area is close to the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. All residents have been forced to evacuate. Many hope to return once radiation levels fall. Huge growth in the population of rats is threatening their hopes. There's no way we can live here like this. What used to be well-cultivated farmland has turned into grassy wasteland. This has created ideal conditions for wild animals to thrive. In May, experts from Fukushima Prefecture and the International Atomic Energy Agency started looking into the situation. Wild animals are adapting faster than we can keep up with. The encroachment of wild animals is threatening to destroy the foundation of people's lives. Welcome to today's close-up. I'm Hiroko Kuniya. It's been two years and four months since high levels of radiation forced people to evacuate areas around the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. This exodus has caused profound changes in the area's ecosystem because of the huge impact humans have on the natural environment. The change is a new threat that people have to confront. Until the accident, the area offered a rich natural environment. Farmers worked their fields, coexisting with the wild animals that lived in the mountains and forests. But over the past two years, fields were left unattended. They have turned into vast expanses of weeds. They've become ideal habitats for wild animals whose population is thriving. While animals reclaimed the living sphere of humans, their behavioral patterns and habits also started to change. Some are causing extensive property damage. How far have wild animals spread? How many live in these areas? Researchers have finally begun surveying the environmental changes that occurred after the evacuation. Let's first look at the damage animals are causing in the area. A large presence of wild animals could dash the residents' hope of returning home as soon as radiation levels drop and the cleanup of their homes is complete. A large part of Okuma town in Fukushima prefecture remains heavily contaminated. Entry is severely restricted. The town lies three kilometers from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. As residents make a brief return home, experts join them to study the situation in the no-entry zone. Rats have eaten it all. The bag containing at least 10 kilograms of rice lies empty. When we came last time in March, the bag had been bitten, but there was still sugar inside. Look at the plum liquor. Rats have wreaked havoc everywhere.
Black rats did this too. Black rats are a variety that lives in and around houses. They have a habit of chewing on cables and other things to shave their front teeth. Rats nibbling on cables can be very dangerous because they can cause a short circuit and start a fire. The electric cables are inside the wall and that's where the rats live. I think all the wiring needs to be redone before people can live in this house again. We visit one place that seems to have been infested by rats. We enter a poultry farm with the owner's permission. Look at what the rats have done. The government was supposed to clean up the carcasses, but rats have already devoured most of them. The wildlife experts find traces of rats breeding inside the poultry farm and spreading to surrounding areas. Civets have been here. This was done by civets? The mass palm civets eat rats. When the rat's breeding ground runs out of food, or when predators close in, they flee and move to a new area. Researchers believe that this scattering of rats over a wider area every time they run out of food or confront a predator is what's causing the damage to spread. The distribution of rats is likely to spread from a 3 kilometer radius to 30 kilometers. It's highly likely that rats are spreading from uninhabited evacuation zones to residential areas beyond. Damage caused by rats is already spreading to areas that were unaffected until now. This is the district of Kiyohashi in Namie town. From April, people have been able to return during the day. Yuko Hangai's home is here, but now she lives in Saitama Prefecture. She says there was no rat damage until last November. The rats have done more damage. They're probably coming in and out from here. She returns to check on her house every month. The damage keeps getting worse on the straw mats, the walls and pillars. I don't know what to say. I never thought my house would be vandalized by rats. Hangai was thinking of returning home because radiation levels were coming down. But now she's close to giving up. The rats have damaged the house so badly that it will need large-scale renovation to make it livable again. There were many times when I yearned to return home. But recently, I don't feel like that anymore. It's not a place to go back to. I'm getting old and losing strength, both mentally and physically. Many residents from Namie live in this temporary housing complex in Nihomatsu. We asked 137 households whether their homes in Namie have suffered damage from rats. More than 80%, or 111 families, replied yes. I caught 22 rats the first time and 23 rats the second time I went back. The stench was horrible. 
There was one year's worth of feces left by 30 to 40 rats. The rat invasion is causing great damage in the restricted zones. But dealing with this problem is far from easy. Black rats are known for being more cautious than other types of mice or rats. One experiment involves placing adhesive sheets around baits. The rats are wary of the traps and stay away. The food is not enough to lure them. Experts say pesticides are not that effective either. They say the use of pesticides could briefly stop the proliferation, but it could also lead rats to develop a resistance to chemicals. When the number of so-called super rats increases, eradicating them becomes extremely difficult. Already two years have passed since humans evacuated the area and the rat population is increasing. Trying to exterminate rats at this stage requires covering an extended area and that's very difficult. The extent of the damage is such that some residents are asking that their homes be demolished. But it's not only rats that are proliferating in the absence of humans. The number of wild boars and monkeys is also surging around the crippled nuclear plant. In May, Fukushima authorities launched a study on wild animals in the restricted zones. Part of the research focuses on wild boars. They are usually very timid animals, but since humans evacuated residential areas around the plant, they seem to have developed different behavioral patterns and expanded their territory. In this deserted town, wild boars are wandering around in broad daylight. Experts say this kind of behavior began after the nuclear accident forced the evacuation of residents. Wild boars are shy animals. Normally, they hardly dare come out during the day when humans are around. But now, they seem unafraid. How is their behavior evolving? In May, Fukushima Prefecture and the IAEA launched a joint survey to find out. Experts are studying areas where evacuees are expected to be able to return relatively soon. The tracks over there show that the boars are not moving along in straight lines. They're wandering around without fear. Wild boars usually move around in straight lines after reaching a residential area as they try to avoid being caught by humans. The wandering tracks indicate they're letting their guard down. Members of the survey team are collecting data about how far wild boars have penetrated into residential areas and in what numbers. The animals appear to be moving from one place to the next during the day to hunt for food. Before the nuclear accident, wild boars mostly lived in mountains and forests. But after humans evacuated, what used to be farmland, shown in green on this map, turned into grassy plains. This has created a comfortable environment for boars to live in.
It's important for animals to maintain a safe distance from humans. Once they know humans are gone, they soon start roaming around freely in broad daylight. Their offspring won't have seen any humans in their life, and they won't be afraid of them. Wild animals are quickly adapting to changes in the environment faster than we can keep up with. Changes in the behavior of wild boars are giving farmers trouble on an unprecedented scale. This farming town in Tamara lies about 20 kilometers from the nuclear plant. Yaiko Matsumoto and her husband Hiroshi have farmed here all their life. This spring, they were able to plant rice for the first time since the nuclear accident. Since early summer, wild boars have been wreaking havoc in their paddies. A wild boar apparently stomped over a water intake and destroyed it, draining all the water out of the paddies. Before the nuclear accident, wild boars never showed up in rice paddies in this area. Now they're frequent visitors digging holes in the paddies. They hunt for earthworms and frogs. In the field, wild boars are also found to be eating crops they didn't eat before. They're devouring ginger, onions and garlic. Crops whose strong smell used to put them off. Our town could become a deserted area occupied by boars. I may be losing my hometown for good. Hunters are busy trying to catch boars to stem the invasion. But there's a limit to what they can achieve. They've destroyed the rice paddies and fields over there. These boars have been snared. But the hunters cannot eat their meat. Up to 61,000 becquerels of radioactive cesium have been detected in the meat of wild boars caught in Fukushima. That's 610 times higher than the government safety limits. Cesium tends to build up inside the body of boars because they eat contaminated grass on the ground. Hunters can operate in areas where radiation levels are lower. But they cannot go into the mountains where the boars live because radiation levels there remain high. I wish I could catch more boars to contribute to the farmer's efforts to start farming once again. It's frustrating. None of this would have happened without the nuclear accident. Joining us is veterinarian Toshio Mizoguchi. He leads the survey on wild animals initiated by the International Atomic Energy Agency and Fukushima Prefecture. A farmer in the report we just saw says she's afraid of losing her hometown in the face of damage caused by boars. It's heartbreaking. You have observed wild animals there during your survey. What do you make of changes in the population and behavioral patterns of animals? I've never seen animal behavior change this much. Please note that relations between humans and animals are based on a delicate balance.
There is a comfortable distance between humans and animals. The Japanese seral, for example, is a protected antelope-like species. Even if they're protected and therefore less cautious, specimens we encountered in the mountains did mind when we approached within less than 15 meters and ran away. But in the report, the camera crew caught boars eating grass within several meters, perhaps five meters away. What's more, boars are usually active only at night because they're shy animals. But it was surprising to see them out in the open like that, in broad daylight. So you didn't expect animals to change their behavior drastically so soon? Definitely not. If these animals are left as they are, younger generations will learn from their mothers that they don't have to be afraid of humans. What's happening in Fukushima is similar to recent incidents involving bears elsewhere in Japan. Bears are also encroaching on communities and causing all sorts of trouble. There was another thing that shocked me in the report. We heard boars are eating onions, garlic and other crops they don't normally eat. At least there were traces of them doing that. If they keep up with this tendency, their range of food preferences will expand. And that, in turn, will change their behavior further. Let's look at how the habitat of wild boars evolved before and after the nuclear accident. Before the accident, boars used to live in the mountains, the brown area on this map. The brown area represents wooded hills adjacent to rural communities. The green areas are where rice paddies and fields used to be. The area is now infested with weeds, as we saw in the report. Boars are omnivore animals. They eat anything but grass is their staple food. On average, 50% of their yearly food intake is composed of grass. Boars were rarely spotted along the coastline, but now they've expanded their habitat to areas along the ocean. So they have no problem finding food. That's right. They're also free to expand their habitat further. When boars are restricted to a certain area, their population growth is capped. But if they're allowed to move around freely, they can conquer space for large clusters of animals and activities such as finding food. As a result, their population grows. Boars are now spotted in rice paddies and damaging the seedlings that have been planted. They know farmers have returned, but they're still venturing out into the fields. What's going on? The community we saw in the report has only a limited number of returnees, maybe only several households. Residents are coming back to homes far apart from each other. Their social infrastructure has yet to be rebuilt for the entire community. There are still farmlands that are left unattended, allowing boars to have it their own way. The community is dotted with only a few households? That's right. We need to think about how to manage the entire environment, including the land infested with weeds. What should we do now when only a handful of families have returned? What should we do once the entire community is returned? Those are critical issues, I think. You say there needs to be more surveys to determine how fast the animal population is increasing and to what extent their habitat is expanding. Yes, we know the behavior of boars in a relatively small area, but how they behave in this large zone is still a mystery. We need to find out. We also need to understand what type of habitat they prefer, where they find food where they cause damage and all that. A closer look at their behavior will give us clues as to where we should focus our efforts. Otherwise, we will be at a loss wondering what measures we should take first. 
Learning about their behavioral patterns is absolutely critical. Like monitoring their behavior? Exactly. We've attached GPS transmitters on some animals. The transmitters send back data about their location every 15 minutes. We're doing this in cooperation with companies specialized in information technology. We're also preparing a project to use tiny dosimeters attached on bores to pinpoint radiation hotspots. How should we deal with so many wild animals in our communities and the rapidly changing environment? We need to look at better ways to capture animals. The point is we need to take comprehensive measures by considering how best we can manage our environment.